Welcome back to Learn Your Radiology, everyone. I'm Brett Weinberg. This is the sixth and final portion of our autoimmune and inflammatory disease series. For this lecture, we're going to talk about vascular processes within the brain. So we've covered a number of other topics on these other lectures, ranging from demyelinating disease all the way through amyloid disease. If you haven't checked out any of these lectures, please uh, feel free to go back and check them out. Today, we're going to focus on vascular processes within the brain. Particularly, we're going to focus on three being vasculitis, moya moya, and catacil. The vascular processes we're going to talk about today, we're really going to key in on vasculitis and moya moya. We'll also take a look at a key mimic, which is uh, catacil, which is a genetic condition that can cause multiple strokes. So we'll take a look at that as well. So we're going to start off with a case. It's a 37-year-old man with stroke symptoms. Here's uh, just a few images from a CT. You know, this is a screening exam. You're kind of seeing like maybe there's an abnormality of the right cerebellum. Clearly the right basal ganglia, including the caudate and the patamen, like don't uh, look normal. So we're going to go on to an MRI. Here you have on the left, you have a flare. On the right, you have a diffusion. You clearly can see the flare abnormality in those same areas as the CT. So very flare bright, very bright on diffusion. So we're worried that those are infarcts. Here you see, if you look up a little bit higher, Kind of in the border zones between the ACA and MCA territory, you see a number of areas of flare abnormality that have us concerned that there's a, been a number of border zone infarcts over time. Here are some images then from a CT angiogram. And uh, so these are MIPS. So that means the slices have been added together. So you can see the maximum intensity. These are really nice for looking at the long axis of vessels, seeing how they look over a long uh, range. Nice for seeing subtle areas of irregularity along the vessel. And here you see on the right MCA, this uh, M1, M2 branch looks pretty irregular. If you zoom in on the left side, you see a similar finding that this uh, left MCA, you see definitely some irregularity of this MCA here as it branches between, uh, between the M1 and M2 uh, branches there. If you take a look at the ACAs on some similar images, so these are sagittal MIPS. And again, so you see that these are the anterior cerebral arteries along the interhemispheric fox here. And you see these vessels are not normal. Vessels should have a normal smooth caliber. They should kind of taper normally uh, distally, so they should gradually get smaller. You shouldn't see these areas where the vessel gets smaller and then gets bigger distally. That's very unusual for intracranial vessels. Uh, here you just see some projectional images showing kind of similar findings. Here you see uh, those ACAs look pretty irregular, kind of almost like sausages on a string or something like that, or beads on a string. Here you see those MCAs right in the sylvian fissure there. Those are markedly abnormal as well. So this is a case of CNS vasculitis. Now this is an arteriopathy you get of the major uh, brain vessels. You can involve large or small arteries. So if you're involving the very small like end arteries, you may not see anything on your MR angiogram. However, uh, in this case, you can see the larger vessels were those that were being uh, affected in this case. Now, primary CNS vasculitis is uh, not associated with a systemic condition, so you, they don't have a known uh, other systemic cause of vasculitis like lupus. Uh, sometimes uh, patients have systemic vasculopathy, so they have a known uh, collagen vascular disease or kind of autoimmune abnormality, which makes them more likely to have a vasculitis. Now, these are extremely difficult to uh, diagnose. Even biopsies uh, can be required. So brain biopsies, you want to try to get uh, some arachnoid surface or some PIA so that you can really see the vessels. But even those can be negative up to 50% of the time. We've seen the findings and we'll go over these again, but that multifocal vascular narrowing uh, that's kind of not explained by atherosclerotic disease is really what you're looking for. Typically, the patients are too young to have extreme vascular disease that uh, you're going to see. So here's just a recap of the case that we saw. Again, that area in the caudate and patamen turned out to be a stroke, but it's very bright on diffusion. Here you just see those findings again. So these are the MIPS. And what you see is that ACA is very irregular. Where I see it becomes narrow, and I just kind of focus on that. Here you see the projectional images of the whole brain. Again, like uh, just emphasizing those areas of multifocal irregularity and narrowing, uh, such as that with that yellow arrow there. Now, when you're thinking about what vessel should look like on CTA or MRA, a normal vessel contour should be like a straw. It should have a normal contour. It should be relatively constant in caliber and may gradually taper as it gets more distal. Uh, in this case, for instance, you see an abnormal contour. So you see these areas of narrowing followed by dilation or normal caliber. 
and when it's kind of multifocal like this, this is something that suggests that you're looking at a case of vasculitis. Uh, you really need to see a long view of the vessel to notice this. Uh, those sagittal MIPS of the ACA are a really nice example. The coronal MIPS of the MCA, you really need to see like the vessel on a, on a kind of a long plane to see this. If you're just scrolling through, it can be much harder to see. Uh, vessel wall imaging now is a specialized MRI technique to look for enhancement and in inflammation of the intracranial vessel walls. It's essentially a specialized sequence where you have fat and flow suppression. You get a pre-contrast image and a post-contrast image to see if the wall of the vessel itself is enhancing. The findings that you'll see is when you have CNS vasculitis, you'll get a circumferential enhancement, so enhancement all the way around the vessel. Uh, if you have atherosclerotic disease, you'll tend to see eccentric enhancement, or you may get enhancement like only in the part that's affected by the plaque, for instance. Uh, here you see just an example. And so this patient got vessel wall imaging, and you see this is a coronal pre-contrast image on the left and a post-contrast image on the right. And take a look at this uh, vessel here, for example, you've got circumferential enhancement around the margins of the ACA. Here you see this kind of tram track like appearance as you catch another vessel uh, a little bit obliquely there. This is what CNS vasculitis looks like on uh, vessel wall imaging. Here you just see some more examples from the same patient. You see a vessel out here, uh, which has nothing on the pre-contrast T1. And again, circumferential enhancement around the wall. You see enhancement around the carotid terminus here. These are areas where the wall of the vessel is actively inflamed. Probably get a little bit out here in the left sylvian fissure as well. You just see those examples, uh, those arrows point to it. Uh, again, in a vasculitis patient, you have circumferential enhancement of the vessel wall, so enhancement along its entire length. So now let's move on to our second case. This is a 49-year-old Thai woman now having the worst headache of her life. I uh, you see some images from a non-contrast CT. See the sylvian fissures here are abnormal. So we've got some blood products in the sylvian fissure, uh, additional blood products in the sylvian fissure here, maybe a little bit of a component of parenchymal hemorrhage as well. Uh, so what was done was the patient got a CTA because anytime you have a hemorrhage like that, you want to look for a vascular cause. Uh, these are some axial MIPS, or this is an axial MIP through a similar level to what we were looking at before. And uh, what I'll point out is if you look at the sylvian fissure here, rather than seeing a nice uh, long MCA uh, in the longitudinal uh, axis here, you don't see much of anything in terms of a big vessel. You see a number of smaller vessels, and you see kind of a similar appearance here. Uh, if you take a look at this, uh, these are coronal MIPS again through that same area. The MCAs are missing, and there's a number of abnormal collateral vessels in that region. Here you just see more of the same. So we have some sagittal MIPS through the midline here. Uh, you definitely see an absence of these normal terminal uh, aspects of the circle of Willis. Here you just see a projectional image from a CTA, and uh, that, that clearly uh, you have a number of abnormal vessels in the cilia fissure that are kind of obscuring everything. And these are not veins, and this is a nice, uh, pretty decent arterial timing. Uh, but what's happening is the, those vessels are obliterated. Uh, here you see an angiogram. It's just going to run through here. Uh, so you can see uh, here you see the right ICA. And uh, again, what you're seeing is you've got uh, a few MCA branches here, perhaps. Uh, but what you're seeing is a lot of collaterals here and uh, not anything that resembles a normal MCA. Uh, here again, you see uh, some a few branches here, but nothing nothing that resembles a normal MCA. A lot of abnormal branches in the left sylvian fissure there as well. So a similar appearance bilaterally. Uh, these are just still images from that, so you can kind of see that a little better. You should have MCA branches like out here in the sylvian fissure, so you sort of have a gap uh, there where you just don't have uh, those vessels. So you're missing a bunch of the MCA branches. Uh, this is a case of Moya Moya disease, and Moya Moya disease is an obliterative angiopathy where you get this gradual occlusion of the bilateral MCAs and replacement with a number of collaterals. And those collaterals in the basal ganglia like are what are the so-called puff of smoke appearance that you get uh, on an angiogram. Uh, this tends to be people of Asian heritage, so it's much more common in Asian people, uh, particularly Asian women. So if you see that, that can be a clue that uh, moya moya is something that you're looking at. Now these patients are candidates for treatment with external carotid to internal carotid bypass. So that might be something that, uh, that you can think about. Now, the phrase moya moya, unfortunately, is a little confusing because people will throw it out to reflect 
any uh, obliterative angiopathy. But secondary obliterative angiopathy, so if you have uh, sickle cell disease or if you have uh, chronic uh, atherosclerotic disease, that's not uh, really Moya Moya. It's kind of a Moya Moya like picture uh, or a Moya Moya syndrome, whereas the primary disease is the primary angiopathy that's predominantly in Asian women. Here you see just a recap of what we saw in that case. The subarachnoid hemorrhage and the Sylvian fissure here, a little parenchymal hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage again. Uh, you just see those uh, abnormalities there. And again, the bilateral MCAs are missing in these images. So you just see there's a bunch of small collaterals and that's the, uh, the puff of smoke there where you're kind of missing those. Those are all those collaterals there uh, with the missing, uh, missing MCAs there. And you see just the same findings uh, on the angiogram that I've kind of already pointed out. Now again, I'll point out to you that uh, you have to think about Moya Moya, whether you're talking about the primary disease or a kind of syndrome. Uh, the, the disease is the obliterative angiopathy, uh, typically idiopathic in young Asian females. Moya Moya syndrome is secondary and can be associated with a number of diseases, neurofibromatosis, uh, atherosclerotic disease, sickle cell disease, and uh, other chronic occlusive diseases. So uh, that's kind of a Moya Moya syndrome. For our final case in this section, we're going to talk about a 48-year-old who's presenting with numbness and weakness. Uh, here you see a, a CT, you can see some edema, the bilateral temporal lobes, maybe the periventricular white matter. Uh, so it definitely doesn't look normal. Uh, when you get the MR, so here's our diffusion, and the diffusion is pretty normal, but it highlights those areas of abnormality in the temporal poles here. You've got some edema. It's predominantly in the white matter of those temporal poles. This is a post-contrast image, so you don't see any enhancement there. And this is just coming up a little bit higher, right? So again, diffusion's negative, but on the uh, flare, what you see is this border zone area of abnormal uh, T2 hyperintensity along the border zone there. Again, not really looking at much in the way of enhancement. Uh, this is a mimic uh, the, that's called a catacil, so that's an autosomal dominant arteriopathy. And uh, what what you're looking at here is you're getting a number of subcortical infarcts and kind of a leukencephalopathy, but, but rather than it being an inflammatory condition, it's associated with this chromosomal abnormality and that's a small uh, and middle vessel uh, size or small and middle size vessel abnormality. And in this, you get all of these white matter abnormalities favoring the temporal, uh, temporal lobes and the external capsule. You tend to spare the frontal and occipital white matter. You can, you can have hemorrhages there. Uh, but this is an autoimmune condition that, uh, that you need to think about. I was wrong. There's going to be one more case here. This is a 50-year-old with uh, dysarthria and paraphrasic errors. Here you see some images from a diffusion-weighted image. You see some diffusion abnormality in the lateral temporal lobe there, some associated flare. If you take a closer look, you've got a little involvement of the left temporal pole there. Uh, if you take a look, uh, you've got some more flare abnormality up a little bit higher there. Uh, so you've got uh, probably more abnormalities there. Uh, if you look at uh, some additional areas of flare, uh, you see the temporal lobes are affected, like kind of superficial uh, white matter there, so kind of the surface of the brain. Uh, here you see an MRA that looks pretty normal, so you're not seeing any uh, large vessel occlusions to explain all of that uh, abnormality. Uh, this is a syndrome called MELAS, or mitochondrial encephalopathy with uh, lactic uh, acidosis and stroke-like symptoms. Uh, in this case, you get uh, kind of these stroke-like episodes. You can get seizure, you get an encephalopathy, and you get a lactic acidosis. Uh, these patients get multiple infarcts that can be symmetrical or not. Uh, they most commonly involve the temporal and parietal lobes. You'll see a lot of swollen gyri with enhancement. Angiography, such as uh, catheter angiogram, MRA, CTA, are usually normal, as they were in this case. Now these uh, these things can often uh, improve. Uh, so when the when the condition is treated, uh, the, a lot of those MR abnormalities will improve and get better. In summary, throughout this lecture, we've looked at a variety of different conditions uh, that are sort of lumped together because they're inflammatory or uh, autoimmune. We saw demyelinating disease, and we saw the scope of that. Encephalitis is like both infectious and otherwise. We covered some unusual inflammatory diseases like sarcoid and orbital inflammatory disease, the inflammatory diseases of the spine being mainly transverse myelitis and sarcoid that you want to think about anytime you have a long segment abnormality in the spine. Amyloid has some unusual manifestations in the CNS as well, 
And then we saw some of these uh, vascular processes like uh, vasculitis and, and moya moya. And so this covers a lot of the common inflammatory and autoimmune things that you need to know about uh, within the brain and CMS, uh, as well, you know, including the spine. So thanks for tuning in to uh, this series of lectures. Uh, be sure to check out the rest of the uh, content on learnneuroradiology.com. Uh, if you want to learn on, uh, more stuff, you know, you can follow us on Twitter. Like we uh, put a bunch of cases on Twitter and do a number of things on there, in addition to non-radiology content as well. So uh, feel free to uh, check those things out as well. Uh, thanks for tuning in today, and uh, be sure to uh, subscribe and check out the rest of the lectures. Thanks.